and we are back for prepping for winter with the Elaine sample chapter. The Waynewoods and Harry the Heir have arrived in the Vale, and Maya Stone comes to Santa and Sweet Robin and tells them that someone needs to greet them. However, for some mysterious reason, Sweet Robin hates Harry the Heir and has a panic attack, leaving them no greeter. After a discussion of who Sweet Robin can marry, Sansa runs out to find Littlefinger in hopes that he will greet the Waynewoods, but she fails to locate him in his solar. And now let's continue. It was clever. The tourney, the prizes, the winged knights, it had all been her notion. Lord Robert's mother had filled him full of fears, but he always took courage from the tales she read him of Sir Artis Aaron, the winged knight of legend, founder of his line. Why not surround him with winged knights, she had thought one night after Sweet Robin had finally drifted off to sleep. His own Kingsguard, to keep him safe and make him brave. And no sooner did she tell Peter her idea, than he went out and made it happen. He will want to be here to greet Sir Harold. Where could he have gone? So with Sweet Robin unable to meet the Waynewoods, Sansa looks for the logical replacement, Littlefinger. Now, as we discussed last time, Littlefinger is not in his solar after news was brought to him by Oswald Kettleblack. I'm not sure why Oswell is still faithful to Littlefinger, considering all three of his sons have suffered under Littlefinger's plans and are now imprisoned, but that's a whole nother story. Now, we later find out the answer to Sansa's question of where Littlefinger went. To the granary, perhaps in a hurry, leaving his solar empty with the window left open. Now, last time I mentioned that the window being left open was a sign that Littlefinger was in a rush, but there is another possibility. When Tyrion travels with Illyrio, he discovers that Varys used to employ a group of small spies that he called mice, the precursors to little birds. These spies were taught to climb walls and sneak in places to read and steal letters. So it just so happens that Varys has an agent at the Gates of the Moon called Sir Shadrick, the Mad Mouse. Now we aren't sure if the Mad Mouse was one of Varys' mice, but he is small in stature and he does work for Varys. So it could be that the Mad Mouse snuck in the window to read Littlefinger's papers and the jousting brackets. Now Sansa thinks her plan to create a Kingsguard for Sweet Robin is clever, and congratulates herself in her head over it. Except that her point of view characters are usually wrong, and her confidence does make me wonder if the reverse is true. Is the plan clever? It does seem a bit obvious, a clear plan for Littlefinger to collect hostages like Michael Redfort and Harry the Heir. Additionally, it seems like a rather politically precarious move for Sweet Robin to establish his own Kingsguard. After all, Renly did a very similar thing, having a Rainbow Guard. He even gave Brienne a place in the Guard after she won a tourney. Bronzion's son Robar was even in this alternate Kingsguard, so I do wonder what these other lords must think the Winged Knights represent. Elaine swept down the tower stairs to enter the pillared gallery at the back of the Great Hall. Below her, serving men were setting up trestle tables for the evening feast, while their wives and daughters swept up the old rushes and scattered fresh ones. Lord Nestor was showing Lady Waxley his prized tapestries with their scenes of hunt and chase. The same panels had once hung in the Red Keep of King's Landing when Robert sat the Iron Throne. Joffrey had them taken down and they had languished in some cellar until Peter Baelish arranged for them to be brought to the Vale as a gift for Nestor Royce. Not only were the hangings beautiful, but the high steward delighted in telling anyone who'd listen that they had once belonged to a king. So Elaine heads into the Great Hall in her search for Littlefinger. Here she sees everyone setting up for the feast later on, with women replacing the rushes. Now, rushes is simply a sort of grass or straw that was put over earthen floors. Now, in truth, noble families in the Middle Ages with finished or stone floors would not have used rushes. They would have used woven mats or carpets. However, medieval fiction writers, including our author, seem to think that everyone, even high nobility, used rushes back in the day. So, here they are. We also have Nestor Royce showing Lady Waxley Robert's tapestries. We don't know much about the Waxleys, except they don't seem to have much problem with Littlefinger. They attended the Corbray wedding and a feast for crows, no problem. Lord Waxley was one of Lysa's suitors, so this Lady Waxley must be a new bride. Additionally, Lord Waxley seems to be an old friend of John Aaron, good enough to know which falcon was John Aaron's favorite. But the Waxleys don't seem to be real power players, and they're not members of the Lord's Declarant. Now let's talk about Robert's tapestries. These tapestries have been popping up in our story since A Game of Thrones. When Robert took down the dragon skulls in the throne room following his rebellion, he put up tapestries to replace them. These tapestries depict hunt and battle, things that Robert loved. And so Cersei had them taken down immediately after Robert's death. Then, oddly, in A Feast for Crows, Littlefinger requests these tapestries from Cersei, and she complies and sends them to him. And now we see what has become of them. Littlefinger has gifted them to Nestor Royce. 
Now gifting these tapestries to Nestor may just be another little finger bribe, but so much time has been given to these tapestries that it seems they must have some significance. It may be that Littlefinger gifted these tapestries to Nestor to ensure that they'd be on display at the Gates of the Moon, for all of the Lords of the Vale to see, rather than being hidden up at the Eyrie. So why on earth does Littlefinger have this fascination with these tapestries, and why does he want to show them to the Lords of the Vale? Well, some fans suspect that Littlefinger is making a statement that he has the support of Cersei and the Baratheon King Tommen, that these tapestries are somehow to intimidate the Lord's Declarant. I find this explanation to be rather weak, the Lannisters are a spent force at this point, and Cersei is in jail. And it's common knowledge that the Lannister-Tyrell alliance is falling apart. Littlefinger showing off his close relationship with Cersei is of little value. I'm more inclined to believe that these tapestries actually depict Baratheons with their dark hair. That these tapestries provide the same function as the Book of Heredity that Eddard sought in A Game of Thrones. And instead of Gendry being the image of Robert that accentuates the point, Littlefinger has Maya Stone right here. In this case, the tapestries would be there to convince the Vale Lords to give up on Tommen. But for which new monarch? Stannis? Aegon? Danny? Harry the Heir? Sansa? Sweet Robin? The creation of a new Kingsguard while hanging these damning tapestries is rather interesting. Now Sansa makes it sound like Nestor is starstruck by these tapestries because they were King-owned. This doesn't sound too probable. Nestor knew Robert very well as Robert was fostered at the Eyrie. In fact, in the wintertime, he would be living at the Gates of the Moon with Nestor. And in fact, those winter years preceded Robert's rebellion. Additionally, Nestor ran the Vale for 15 years while John Aaron was hand. He would not be impressed by tapestries simply because they were owned by a king, or even Robert. Something else is going on with them. Peter was not in the Great Hall. Elaine crossed the gallery and descended the stair built into the thick west wall to come out the inner ward where the jousting would be held. Viewing stands had been raised for all those who had come to watch, with four long tilting barriers in between. Lord Nestor's men were painting the barriers with whitewash, draping the stands with bright banners, and hanging shields on the gates the competitors would pass through when they made their entrance. Now at first glance, this passage seems like a fairly innocuous description of the jousting field. However, this paragraph is strikingly similar to a paragraph from the Hedge Knight, where Dunk views a jousting field at the Ashford tourney. There's whitewashed barriers, the lanes, the viewing stands, the hung shields, the hopefuls hitting quintains. Some of the language is actually word for word. And I will say it's difficult to not see at least a couple parallels between the Ashford tourney and this upcoming tourney. The Ashford tourney was to celebrate the 13th birthday of Lord Ashford's daughter, and Sansa is also 13. Additionally, a hardying was a major competitor at the Ashford tourney. There is a theory out there that the Ashford champions share the surnames of Sansa's potential husbands, Baratheon, Tyrell, Lannister, Hardying, and perhaps in the future Targaryen. However, this theory kind of falls apart once we remember that Sansa was betrothed to Sweet Robin briefly, and no Aaron was at the Ashford tourney. Now, quite a bit went down at the Ashford tourney, but one big event was that Humphrey Hardying was a champion, and Humphrey Hardying was killed. Specifically, he was impaled in the crotch during Dunk's trial by battle. So we have to wonder if history may repeat itself with a Hardying again, in some form. At the north end of the yard, three Quintains had been set up, and some of the competitors were riding at them. Elaine knew them by their shields. The Bells of Belmore, Green Vipers for the Linderleys, the Red Sledge of Breakstone. House Tolette's black and gray piley. Sir Michael Redfort set one quintain spinning with a perfectly placed blow. He was one of those favored to win wings. So next Sansa spies five competitors for the upcoming tourney. We have a Bellamore, most likely Marwyn Bellamore, the captain of the guards at the Gates of the Moon. Marwyn used to be the captain of the guards at the Eyrie, but was relieved by Lysa in favor of Lothar Brune. I imagine Marwyn is likely unhappy about his demotion. Now, Lord Benadar Belmore is a member of the Lord's Declarant, but Littlefinger calls him corrupt and thinks he can buy him off. We aren't sure about Marwyn's relationship with Lord Belmore, his son, his nephew, cousin. Still, being captain of the Guard at the Gates of the Moon likely makes him loyal to Nestor Royce and likely hostile to Littlefinger and Lothar Brune. Now, having Marwyn become a winged knight doesn't really help Littlefinger, as he already has him at the Gates of the Moon as an effective hostage anyway. There is also a Linderly, who is likely Lyman Linderly. The Linderlys seem to have no problem with Littlefinger. They sent their heir Terence Linderly to be Sweet Robin's squire, and thus Littlefinger's hostage. 
The Linderleys aren't Lord's declarant, and they attended the Corbray wedding back in A Feast for Crows, no problem. However, having Lyman be a winged knight doesn't really help Littlefinger, as he already has Terence at the Gates of the Moon. The Breakstone that is spied is likely Edmund Breakstone. We know nothing about this man or his house. And then there's the Tillettes. The Tillette we see is likely Andrew Tillette. Now we know very little about Dolores Ed's old house, they accompanied the Lord's Declarant when they came to speak with Littlefinger, but they are not official signatories. So it seems they are slightly anti-Littlefinger. So it would be advantageous for Littlefinger to secure Andrew Tolette as a winged knight. And of course we have Michael Redfort. The Redforts are currently very anti-Littlefinger, being members of the Lord's Declarant, with Michael married to Bronzion's daughter. That said, Littlefinger thinks there will be a change in the house's position if old Lord Redfort dies. Taking Michael as a hostage through the Winged Knights would be extremely useful for Littlefinger. Peter was not at the Quintains, nor anywhere in the yard. But as she turned to go, a woman's voice called out, Elaine! cried Miranda Royce from a carved stone bench beneath a beech tree, where she was seated between two men. She looked in need of rescue. Smiling, Elaine walked toward her friend. So Sansa is in a rush to find Littlefinger, but lo and behold, Miranda Royce calls Sansa over to waste her time. So, so far now, we have Benjicott, a Royce employee who gave negative information to Sweet Robin about Harry the Heir, and we have Maya, a Royce employee who caused Sweet Robin to have a panic attack by mentioning Harry the Heir. This caused Sweet Robin to be incapable of being a greeter, and so Sansa had to search for Littlefinger. But now this quest is being interrupted by Randa Royce. Randa is a sneaky one, and Sansa is completely oblivious, thinking her her friend. Now Sansa thinks Randa looks like she needs saving, but I sincerely doubt that this is actually the case. Randa is the hostess of the castle and should be quite busy. She could easily have dismissed herself politely to attend to anything, or impolitely if she wanted. This is Randa after all. She's quite bold. Not to mention we should look at where Randa is. Randa clearly went out to the practice yard where the knights were training. She was looking for interaction, not trying to avoid it. And so I believe Randa is feigning wanting to be saved. Miranda was wearing a gray woolen dress, a green hooded cloak, and a rather desperate look. On either side of her sat a knight. The one on her right had a grizzled beard, a bald head, and a belly that spilled over his sword belt where his lap should have been. The one on her left was no more than 18, and skinny as a spear. His ginger-colored whiskers only partially served to disguise his angry red pimples that dotted his face. The bald knight wore a dark blue surcoat emblazoned with a huge pair of pink lips. The pimply ginger lad countered with nine white seagulls on a field of brown, which marked him for a shet of Gulltown. He was staring so intently at Miranda's breasts that he hardly noticed Elaine until Miranda rose to hug her. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Randa whispered in her ear before she turned to say, Sirs, may I present you the Lady Elaine Stone? So Randa is with an Ossifer Lips and the unfortunately named Other Shet. Now we know nothing about House Lips, and I'm not sure if Ossifer Lips is supposed to be a pun. Ass for Lips? Ossifer seems quite out of shape and probably too old to be at this tournament. I'm guessing Littlefinger invited him as an easy opponent for those he really wants to win. Other Shet is probably supposed to be a poop joke, with his name being a pun on either Other Shit or Utter Shit, his shield being brown with a bird known for defecating. Jokes aside though, House Shed of Gulltown came with the Lord's Declarant when they went to talk to Littlefinger, though they aren't members themselves. So like House Tolette, they seem to be slightly anti-Littlefinger, and so Littlefinger would benefit from obtaining Sir Other as a hostage. The Lord Protector's daughter, the bald knight announced, all hearty gallantry. He rose ponderously. All full as lovely as the tales told of her, I see. Not to be outdone, the pimply knight hopped up and said, Sir Officer speaks truly, you are the most beautiful maid in all the Seven Kingdoms. It might have been a sweeter courtesy had he not addressed it to her chest. So here we find out that Sir Ossifer is so out of shape that it's hard for him to stand, and his easy gallantry shows his age and experience. Again, it's very odd that he's at this tourney. This tourney is supposed to be for young men, and so I suppose Littlefinger invited him because he wants Sir Ossifer to lose. Though I will say it may be a mistake to discount Sir Ossifer's experience. Sir Other, of course, is the exact opposite of Sir Ossifer. Young, skinny, inexperienced, awkward, and probably someone Littlefinger would like to win. Now Sir Other can't stop staring at Randa or Sansa's boobs. Now yes, this shows Sir Other's inexperience, but it also shows that both Randa and Sansa are probably dressed provocatively. Sansa, of course, is trying to attract Harry the heir. 
But who is Randa trying to attract? Randa has been quite open with Sansa about who she'd like to marry. She's expressed interest in Harry the Heir and Littlefinger, two men who share nothing in common save one thing, their potential for power. And you have seen all those maids yourself, sir, Elaine asked him. You are young to be so widely traveled. He blushed, which only made his pimples look angrier. No, my lady. I am from Gulltown, and I am not. Though Elaine was born there, she would need to be careful around this one. I remember Gulltown fondly, she told him with a smile as vague as it was pleasant. So here we find, in addition to wasting Sansa's precious time, Randa has introduced Sansa to a Gulltown native. And Elaine is supposed to be from Gulltown as well, raised by the Faith. Now Randa quizzed Sansa on all sorts of things when they came down the mountain, but the real giveaway that Elaine is a phony was her failing to have interest in the new High Septon when she was raised by the Faith, and her instead showing interest in Jon Snow as the new Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. She even blurts out Jon's name. This is even more evidence for Randa that Elaine is a fake, Elaine, a supposed Gulltown native, has nothing to say to Sir Other. To Miranda, she said, Do you know where my father's gotten to, perchance? Let me take you to him, my lady. I do hope you will forgive me for depriving you of Lady Miranda's company, Elaine told the knights. She did not wait for a reply, but took the older girl arm in arm and drew her away from the bench. Only when they were out of earshot did she whisper, Do you really know where my father is? Of course not. Walk faster. My new suitors may be following. So, Randa claims that she doesn't know where Littlefinger is, which is a pretty dubious claim, and we eventually find out that Littlefinger is in Royce's granary with other lords making major plans about food. It would be highly unlikely Littlefinger would be down there without at least Nestor Royce's knowledge, who would in turn tell his partner in crime Randa about it. Additionally, Randa is an enormous gossip and would likely know the whereabouts of major lords like Grafton, Belmore, and Littlefinger within her own castle. Now, Randa says that her supposed suitors might be following her, but they are not. And as I pointed out, she's the one that went to their training area. She was looking for conversation, not running from it. I would guess that Randa feigned this whole situation in order to have Sansa talk to other Shet and to waste her time. Ossifer Lips is the dullest knight in the Vale, but other Shet aspires to his laurels. I am praying they fight a duel for my hand and kill each other. Elaine giggled. Surely Lord Nestor would not seriously entertain a suit from such men. So here, clearly, Sansa and Randa think Sir Ossifer and Sir Other are far beneath Randa's station. And this brings up a very interesting topic. Who is appropriate for Randa? The Junior Royces may not have the status of the Senior Royces, but Nestor was described as a formidable lord even back in A Game of Thrones prior to getting the Gates of the Moon. Nestor thought himself high enough to marry Lysa, and Randa has spoken of wanting to marry Harry Hardying, Littlefinger, and Lynn Corbray. So the Junior Royces do seem to have a fairly high status, and if not that, very high ambitions. Oh, he might. My Lord Father is annoyed with me for killing my last husband and putting him to all this trouble. It was not your fault he died. There was no one else in the bed that I recall. Elaine could not help but shudder. Miranda's husband had died when he was making love with her. So our author has been very coy about saying who Randa's husband was, so I do think his identity will prove to be important. Now, we can puzzle out a pretty good guess on who he is, though nothing is certain. So one thing that is helpful in narrowing things down is accepting that the Royces are ambitious and would only marry a High Lord, likely a Vale Lord. So we're looking for someone that's on the level of a Corbray or a Hardying, and not someone as low as a Shet. And we know that the man was extremely old and likely a widow. Another clue about Randa's marriage is that Randa was away when Sansa passed through the Gates of the Moon in a Storm of Swords perhaps hinting that she was married during this time. So taking all of this into account, the man who makes most sense is actually Old Lord Ian Hunter. House Hunter is a powerful enough house, and we know the Lord was very old, and he was single in A Game of Thrones, as he was one of Lysa's suitors. And we also know he died suddenly in A Storm of Swords when Miranda was away. And we don't really know of anyone else who would fit the bill. Now interestingly, Littlefinger seems to think that Harlan Hunter murdered his father. If Ian was Randa's husband, it should be interesting to know how this all went down. And this is a good place to stop. We'll see you in Elaine 1, Part 4.